Okay, it's time to get started. It's good to see everyone out today. We've got a beautiful morning. The temperature is really great. And if you were not here yesterday for the fish fry, you really missed out. We had uh, four fryers going out there and we was frying fish as fast as we could and hush puppies and french fries and it just wasn't fast enough for the women I tell you. <laughs> but uh, we had a good time and hope everybody that came had a good time and we had a lot of help. It takes a lot to do a fish fry. Bobby provided all the fish and uh, 340 something fillet, crappie fillets and then we had, uh, we had uh, 60 pounds of fresh cut potatoes for fries and then hush puppies and then all the sides that people brought and uh, so much help out there. I better not even try to to mention the names of the people that helped us with the cooking and with running food in and out but it was great and we just really want to thank everybody for for coming out for that. We're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 11 this morning and I'm going to tell you this was a rough study for me uh, uh, and uh, a lot of the chapters in Revelation are hard hard studies but uh, as I told you earlier on, I refuse to be afraid of Revelation and afraid to study it because it's just like the rest of the Bible. It's uh, God's written Word to, to us and there's so many things we can learn from it. So I, I know that uh, throughout this time that we've been studying Revelation, we've, uh, we've talked about historical events. Greg came and spoke one Sunday morning and talked about some historical events. I've talked about historical events. And I'm going to do that one more time this morning uh, to try to bring some of the things together that we've talked about before we get into chapter 11. And then I'll, then I'll try to not to put so much of a history in the rest of, the, the rest of our studies uh, as we have so far. But it's, it's really important to understand what was going on uh, at the time that John was writing. Not necessarily at the time that John was writing this, but more about what was going to happen. And that's what the, the, the revelation was all about, with things that were to come. And these things that were to come was going to go over, uh, carry over into hundreds of years, and even to the point where it talks about the return of Christ. So, uh, so there's a lot that goes on in the book of Revelation. And uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, let's see here. I wanted to cover a couple of things before we get started. I hope I didn't get my notes messed up here. <laughs> Give me just a moment. Okay, so what I wanted to do first is I wanted to show, I want to, I want to show you two arguments that are out there that people, uh, where people talk about uh, when the book was written. And it really doesn't matter when the book was written. It doesn't matter what year John uh, was uh, on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion about it. So this morning I'm going to show you two sides of, of it. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not even going to tell you which way I'd lean because uh, I've changed my mind two or three times through this study. But when, when you look at people that support the, the, the idea that uh, the, the, the writing of Revelation was in A.D. 95-96. Um, first of all, it's believed that John was born in A.D. 6 and died in A.D. 100 at the age of 94. Uh, Polycrates uh, wrote in the second century that John's tomb was in Ephesus and that he was a martyr. Uh, we don't find that in the Bible, but these are just some, some historians that write things. Another guy named Irenaeus wrote in 180 A.D. that John died in Ephesus. And he also claimed that John wrote the Gospel while in Ephesus in the book of Revelation when he was on Patmos. Uh, many people believe that Revelation was written between 95 and 96 A.D. because they believe that the Roman Emperor Domitian was the one that exiled John to Patmos at the end of his reign. And there is no doubt that Domitian was probably one of the, uh, uh, I don't know, most evil uh, of the Roman emperors, uh, which kind of would, would make sense it, it, talking about uh, that time frame. And those that agree with this 95-96 AD writing use Arrhenius' writing to make that conclusion. So a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, their support comes from his writings. Uh, of course we know that the island of Patmos was used to keep criminals in the first century. And so John was considered to be a criminal when, when he was put on the Isle of Patmos. And we know that the Roman Emperor Domitian was the 11th Roman Emperor that reigned from 8196 AD 
uh, from 81 to 96 AD, and he was the son of the Roman Emperor Vespian and the younger brother, or young brother of Emperor Titus. So uh, these are just some notes and things that I've, I've pulled out uh, about, about uh, this time frame that most people believe uh, when it was written. And then you have those that support an earlier writing of Revelation. Some historians uh, believe that the Emperor Nero was the one that put uh, John on Patmos. And, uh, and they believe that uh, uh, you know, this would have been prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, they believe that this because Nero reigned from 54 to 68 AD. Uh, and, and it's interesting that as I was studying that uh, one of the guys that really pushes this this idea, um, he has a lot of interesting, um, we'll call them facts and quotes that he, he is using to, to say that. Uh, if Domitian sent John to Patmos, then John wrote the book of Revelation when he was about 90 years old. And if it was Nero, then John was about 62 years old when he wrote the book. And so, again, it doesn't matter, but we're studying this stuff, so we'll talk about it. Jerome, uh, who lived from 340 A.D. to 430 A.D., wrote that Domitian exiled John, but he also wrote later that Nero exiled John. So one of the things that I'm learning as I continue my study is that uh, even some of these historians contradict themselves. And, and you're looking at people that, that lived hundreds or hundreds of years after this happened and after these things happened, telling everybody exactly how it happened. So they weren't there. They weren't there. They're just, they're actually writing their opinions just like uh, all commentators do. Uh, many writers about uh, John and the book of Revelation actually came from false teachers of the gospel and were written, again, hundreds of years after John died. For example, a guy named Jacob of Edessa, uh, who lived from 640 A.D. to 708 A.D., he became a bishop in 684 A.D., and was a member of the Syriac uh, Syriac Orthodox Church. Uh, so he's a guy that wrote a lot of stuff, and he studied the Syriac Bible uh, that was written toward the end of the third century. That's the Bible he went by. So the Syriac Bible states that John was thrown onto the island by the Emperor Nero. Again, we're talking about uh, a lot of these writers being uh, at that time were actually false teachers, and so a lot of times historians will use their writings and we don't know uh, if they're right or, or, or not. We just don't know. Uh, some writers have uh, used Revelation chapter 17, 10 to support their belief of an earlier writing where it says, and, and they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes he must remain a little while. And yet those that believe that it was a later writing and that Domitian was the one that put John on the Isle of Patmos, they will use this same scripture and we're going to talk about how each one uses the scripture differently to support their, uh, their, their thinking on this. Uh, if these seven kings refer to the first seven emperors, and again, uh, this is going to get a little hairy here, but just, just stay with me, I think you'll get, catch on, then there could be merit to the idea of the earlier writing. So that's one of the things we're going to look at. So let's go back and look at the seven kings that this particular commentary that I was reading on talks about. Number one would have been Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar reigned between 49 and 44 BC, okay? Uh, but he was never officially called an emperor, even though if you look up Emperor Julius Caesar, you'll find him, but he was never officially called an emperor. And he established and this was I thought was interesting. He was the one that established the, uh, the 365 day, 12 month a year calendar uh, that we use today. He also granted Roman citizenship to everyone living under Roman rule. After the Apostle Paul became a Christian and was ba uh, being persecuted by the Jews, if you remember, he declared himself as being a born a, a Roman citizen. And, and it actually saved him, the Romans actually saved him from the Jews in Acts chapter 22, verses 25 through 29. And, um, uh, and what I think is interesting about that story, it kind of reminds us of how uh, early on uh, when uh, 
the, the, uh, the Israelites had moved into Egypt and they were friends with the Egyptians and the Egyptians took care of them and, and, and provided food for them. But over a period of time, uh, the Egyptians uh, uh, became evil and began treating the uh, Israelites like slaves. Well, we kind of see the same thing in history that happened with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at, at, at times was actually uh, helpful to the church and it was helpful to, to uh, to, uh, to Paul in Acts chapter 22, uh, the, the Jewish people were, were, were persecuting Christians at this time, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, Roman, the Roman government, they were, they were kind of neutral. They didn't care. I mean, they didn't care about the Jews or the, 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 uh, the Christians, but at that time, it was the, the Jews that were persecuting Christians. And then we see where Julius Caesar was eventually murdered by dozens of members of his own Senate. And that was one thing that, that and Greg talked about that, how that so many times uh, where people were power hungry, uh, if you wanted to be an emperor, you better be prepared to die because somebody's liable to kill you. Augustus Caesar would have been number two. And if, if you don't count Julius Caesar, then he'd be number one. So he would have been the number one uh, uh, emperor. But he, was, uh, he, he reigned somewhere between 27 BC and 14 AD. And uh, he, had, he adopted the son, he was adopted son of Julius Caesar, and uh, he was the first official uh, emperor of Rome. And, and the month of August was actually named after him, after Augustus Caesar. Uh, he was considered as the greatest emperors of Rome, and he introduced a period of peace known as the Pax Romana, uh, and the empire flourished during this time. Uh, he created tax incentives for families with more than three children. I thought this was interesting. And he penalized marriages that were childless. And the reason he did that was because he was wanting to increase the Roman population. So he would actually uh, penalize uh, families or, or husbands and wives that did not have children. Uh, he also strengthened uh, the, the, the legendary aqueduct system. And he, he died of natural causes. But we know that the Romans... Uh, while, while they were in power, they did a lot of good things uh, for, for humanity. I mean, they built roads. They, uh, they just did a lot of things that were good. But we know that power over time generally corrupts people. And we see that, uh, we see that and see that in history where the Roman Empire uh, be, began to become corrupt and eventually it fell. Tiberius came next, number three. Uh, he reigned from 14 to 37 A.D., and he expanded the Roman Empire greatly uh, by his military conquest. In other words, by, by, he, just, he just took over a lot, of, a lot of land. He widened his empire deep into the Croatian, uh, what was today known as Croatia, uh, Croatia I'm sorry, and Germany. Uh, and he was described by people that knew him as being irritating uh, irritatingly successful. In other words, uh, he was successful, but people didn't really like him. And then uh, this next guy, Caligula, I hope I'm pronouncing him right, uh, he reigned from 37 to 41 AD, and he was born Gaius Caesar, but the Caligula name was, uh, was basically a childhood nickname that, that stuck with him, uh, and it, which meant Little Boot. And I don't know why they called him Little Boot, but that was his nickname. And he was severely ill for seven months after becoming the emperor. And some thought that his illness made him mentally ill. And he, he was a very cruel emperor. And he and his wife and daughter were murdered. Uh, and after they were murdered, his nephew, Claudius, became emperor. So Claudius would have been number five if we're counting correctly. Claudius was emperor from 41 to 54 AD. Uh, when, when Caligula was killed, uh, someone found Claudius hiding, and, and they said he was trembling in the palace. Uh, a soldier was one that found him after, after Caligula and his family were killed. And the Praetorian Guard and the emperor house, imperial household troops made him emperor the very day after Caligula's death. Uh, it's interesting, here's a trembling person hiding, and that's who they chose to make emperor. Senators and knights uh, tried to kill uh, Cal uh, Claudius, uh, but they failed. He too extended the Roman rule uh, into North Africa. He had several wives, 
And it's interesting as I was reading up about some of these people, there was, there was a lot of times where they would take, take wives to, and get rid of wives and things like that. Uh, they had no morals because they were not following God. Uh, Claudius invaded Britain in A.D. 43 and he expanded the kingdom of Herod Agrippa I. And it's believed that he was poisoned by poison mushrooms. That's, that's what they think caused him to die. And then, of course, he was succeeded by Nero. Nero came next, which on my list here we're going to call it number six. Uh, he re reigned from 54 to 68 A.D. There were plots uh, uh, to murder him. Uh, there was incest in his reign. There was a murder by his mother, Agrippa, Agrippina. Uh, she was a wicked person. Uh, and she was the one that put Nero in, in the position of power, but she tried to rule kind of behind the scenes. Uh, it was the first time that a 16-year-old boy uh, had absolute power over the Roman Empire. So Nero was young when he, when he became emperor. And uh, his mother tried to control him and the government, but eventually two guys, Burrus and Seneca, uh, kind of forced her out of the picture a little bit. Uh, initially when Nero became emperor, he was a pretty good guy. You know, he, he was pretty good. But over time, uh, he, he, he became evil. Uh, he did not like, they said he did not like signing death sentences in, in the very beginning. And he hated the, the, the Roman tax collectors because they were always ex, uh, extortioning people and, and doing things they shouldn't do. But that's the way he was in the, in the beginning. But eventually, he became a very brutal dictator. And uh, uh, he actually had his mother put to death along with his wife, Octavia. Uh, there was a great fire set in Rome in A.D. 64, a very large fire. And even though uh, Nero was about 35 miles away when it happened, Romans believed that he set the fires. They just felt like he set the fires because he came back and started rebuilding things the way he wanted to. We don't know who set the fires. But Nero, since he saw that he was being blamed for setting the fires, uh, he decided to put the blame on to Christians. Okay? So when he started blaming the Christians for burning Rome, guess what happens? Christians are going to be persecuted because of that. Uh, and this caused kind of a, a half-hearted persecution towards Christians at that time. He earned the reputation of, of being an antichrist uh, in early Christian tradition. We don't know how true that is. Uh, he became an extravagant spender uh, on his courts, his new buildings, and gifts to his favorite people. Uh, so he's spending a lot of money, and then eventually plots to murder him began to appear. And eventually there was revolts uh, that spread, and, and uh, they made a guy named Ga Galba uh, an emperor, the emperor. Uh, it's, uh, I read here, and I don't know how true it is, that uh, Nero was condemned to a slave's death. There is speculation that he stabbed himself in the throat with a dagger to avoid uh, being, being punished like a slave. And there was another account that said he escaped to the Greek islands uh, where he was arrested and sentenced to death. But to be honest with you, just based on what I was reading, I don't think they really know what happened to him. Uh, uh, the next guy who Galba, uh, if, I, if I'm pronouncing that right, who took over from Nero, he would be the number seven that I have on this list. He, he, um, he, he ruled for a long time. He ruled from 68 A.D. to January of 69 A.D. He, he ruled for seven months, okay? <laughs> he tried to cut back on this extravagant spending of Nero, but you know, when, when you have an emperor that spends a lot of money, and is, it gives a lot of money away and things like that, and then you have another emperor come in and try to cut that back, uh, he was very unpopular, and uh, he was assassinated by a close ally, so uh, that didn't go over too good. And then after Galba, we have Marcus uh, Otho Caesar, who, who reigned for three months and one day. He committed suicide. Uh, we have a guy named Aldus Vitellus, who, who reigned for eight months and a day. He was murdered by Vespian's troops. Then Vespian comes into the picture. He ruled for nine years, 11 months. He died of natural causes. And then Titus comes after him. He, he ruled for two years and two months. He died of natural causes. And then we get to Domitian in 81 AD, and he ruled all the way through 96 AD, which was 15 years and, and actually four days. Uh, and we know he was, he, he was assassinated. And he was known uh, for his reign of terror. 
That's what Domitian is known for. So if, big if, the seven kings mentioned in Revelation 17 was referring to these emperors, then Nero would have been the emperor during the time that John was on the Isle of Patmos. But since Julius Caesar was not actually considered an emperor, this kind of throws a monkey wrench into that idea, doesn't it? Because then it, it, it drops everything down one number. If, if uh, uh, Julius Caesar was not actually considered a, 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 an emperor, and, and that uh, would throw the timetable off. And it becomes more complicated than that. Uh, I know that some of our members here have given me books and given me uh, uh, CDs and uh, different uh, sources of information. I've been listening to some of this stuff and reading some of this stuff, and I'm, I'm learning a lot it really, uh, from these things, and I appreciate them doing that. And one of the things that I learned uh, really quick, and, and I think we all know this, is that when you read the, Rev the book of Revelation, if you don't have a good standard understanding of the Old Testament, especially the uh, books like the book of Daniel and, and uh, different books uh, of prophecy, then you're not going to understand a lot of the things that we read about in, in the book of Revelation. So I'm going to keep going here. I'm kind of doing a lecture, and then we'll, we'll try, then we'll open up to the floor here in a few minutes. All right. So, uh, moving on here, if you go back to Daniel chapter 7, when it refers to ten horns, you will learn that Daniel says that three of them fell, okay? We're going to talk about that more when we get into chapter 17. I want to, don't want to jump too far ahead. So, uh, if, when you think about that, uh, it kind of changes a whole lot of the uh, dynamics of, of when uh, John was put on the Isle of Patmos. So, if Julius Caesar uh, is not counted as one of the seven kings, and three of the emperors fell, as we read about in the book of Daniel, from the head uh, in Daniel 7 verse 20, then we end up with who as emperor? For number seven, Domitian. Domitian. Okay? And so that's, that would have been the time frame that, that John uh, was put on the island. Now, some of the, the comments that I heard listening to some of the information I gave it, it's, uh, that I got really made a lot of sense to me. And one is the fact that assuming that Domitian was in power, and that Domitian was the one that put John on the Isle of Patmos, and John is writing the book of Revelation, he had to be a little careful, and I'm sure God that was helping him with this, about how he wrote about the emperor that was in power, right? It makes sense, because if he wrote it in a simple way, that Domitian and all of his people that worked under him understood that, that John was writing about him in a bad way, well, John would have probably been killed immediately. So it's, it's like John is writing in a secret code so that only people that were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, which would have been Jews, which would have been uh, the Christians at that time, all of them would have been very familiar with the writings of Daniel and all these different uh, prophet, prophets in the Old Testament. And so they would be able to understand what he was talking about. But people like Domitian and people that, uh, uh, in the Roman Empire, they would have been just like us. They'd have been kind of confused and not understanding what he talked about. So we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into chapter 17. But I, uh, I want to just throw all that out at you to kind of let that stuff be uh, simmering in your head. Any comments before we get into chapter 11? Yes, ma'am. Let, let him come with the mic here. Sorry about that. I should have said something. That's okay. Um, that little, the theory that you said there, if he was writing it for people who really understood the original Old Testament scriptures, if that's true, that is just more 
indication to us of how we need to study it and how important it is to us. Absolutely, and that's, that's one of the things, I, there's so many things that I'm learning from the book of Revelation, and, and that's exactly one of them, is that we need to study the Old Testament more to be able to understand so much in the New Testament. Thank you for that comment. Any other comments? Got one over here. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of back you up on, on the Daniel uh, reference. Um, if you look at, there's two places in Revelation, in, in chapter 1, verse uh, 13, when, um, when John turns around to see what is behind him, um, it, uh, it says that uh, in verse 13, and in the middle of the lamp stands one like a son of man. It doesn't say the son of man, it says a son of man. Mm -hmm. And then um, in... 1414, 14, Revelation 1414, 14. Um, and I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus' favorite reference to himself was the son of man. Right. And I looked up, um, I can find five references or five phrases of a son of man. Mm -hmm. um, and four of them refer to humanity or mankind, right. like the environment was not fit for a son of man. Mm -hmm. But one of them um, is in Daniel chapter 7 in um, verse 13. And I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And I think this is where a couple of last week or a week before, I mentioned that Revelation was written as a group study. And I think that when this kind of thing was brought up, somebody in the study would have said, wait a minute, I remember where this is. And it would brought them back to uh, Daniel 7, where they would have seen in, um, well, in 24 through 26, where it counts down through the kings. Right. Um, and um, I agree with your findings that Julius Caesar, he was never considered an emperor. Right. So if you count from that, if you count starting with Augustus, it comes up with Domitian. And then... Um, if, you, if you rule those th other three out that supposedly fail, yeah. Right, yeah. which is also stated in, in Daniel chapter that, seven. That's right. Daniel, if you read Jan Daniel chapter seven, it is almost verse for verse like what we're reading in Revelation. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is eerily uh, like. And also, I just wanted to mention in Daniel 7, verse 26, um, it says that after this, um, after describing who I believe to be Domitian, mm -hmm. it says, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away annihilated and destroyed forever. Uh, Domitian was killed in a conspiracy by his court. Mm -hmm. And after that, he was hated so much that the Senate um, did a legal damnation of his name mm -hmm. where anything government sponsored, uh, like statues or quotes or records from him was wiped from the record. They didn't want to you know anything about him. And that's, yeah. That's something that we have trouble with finding information about Domitian to this day is because the Roman government wiped his history out. Right. So let me ask you this question. Uh, through our studies so far, uh, do you think that John died on the Isle of Patmos? I think he was sent there to die. Yeah, he was think, a copper you, man. Why would you send a 90-year-old man to a copper mine? Right. Do you think he got to leave? Do you think he got to leave the island? I think there's indication that he left the island, I don't, that he didn't die there. And I think that some of, your, some of the guys I just mentioned even mentioned that he, he died in Ephesus. So we don't know that for sure. But, yeah, I, I, I feel like just based on some of the stuff we've studied so far, that he, and that we, I see some heads nodding no, but, but, again, it doesn't really matter. Yes? The one that is to come. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, then that puts the one who is at that base there. Yes. Which would, which would be when this was written. Um, so it, 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 puts, it puts John on the Isle of Patmos under that base, which is an interesting thing because there doesn't seem to be any historical evidence that he went to Patmos on the base to take that base. Right. Right. And so this writing that talks about how uh, Domitian banished Paul, or sorry, yeah, yeah, that Paul was banished under Domitian and restored under the fact that under the Roman king. You mean John? You mean John? John. Yeah, sorry, yeah. John. I'm sorry. Um, how he was banished under Domitian and later restored under this other fellow. It could have happened, it could have just happened much earlier than we think it did while Domitian was an acting emperor, not active. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, I tell you, it's just interesting stuff. Uh, and, and I can't imagine, as, as uh, Gene just talked about, how that when, all right, Christians at, at that time, New Testament Christians, and then also Jews, who had studied the old law, the Old Testament, their, hopefully their entire lives, was very familiar with the writings of Daniel and Ezekiel and all these, these prophets, but they really didn't know what they meant, right? They, 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 they read these things and it was kind of like Greek to them like, like the book of Revelation sometimes is to us. But when knowing those scriptures and then when the book of Revelation was distributed to the churches, and that's what it was written for was the churches at that time, man, they could start putting these things together and start understanding it a little bit more. And it, it also just reminds us of how powerful, how, how much wisdom God has when he put this, put the word of God together for us. So, in right. Yeah. And before I did this study, I never thought about how that the Book of Revelation. This, this, this stuff that's being revealed to John, how that it actually covered hundreds of years. You know, you, you first you think that all this stuff was going to be pretty quick because it talks about soon to, soon to come pass. You know, it, it says in the first part of the, the chapter of one that this is going to all happen soon. But you got to remember in God's timeline, uh, uh, things can get spread out pretty long. The stuff began happening soon. But it continued over a long period of time. And if some of these commentaries I read are correct about how that some of this stuff we're talking about goes all the way into the Reformation movement in the, in the 1200s, then we're talking about over a thousand years of period of time that's being covered uh, just so far in what we've talked about. And even in chapter 11, uh, it's going to touch on uh, the Day of Judgment. So, uh, so a lot of stuff going on. Any other comments before we get started in chapter 11? This was a rough one on me. I, I had a hard time on this one. I'm going to read it and then we'll, by the time I get through reading it, it'll be time to quit, but we'll read it. 
Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for forty-two months. Again, we're in a vision. Keep that in mind. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire blows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and the tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a voice, a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and have, gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. I'm going to stop there so we can talk about some of this, and we'll finish up uh, 15 through 19 next week. But in chapter 10, uh, we see where John's vision, which had been in heaven, in other words, he was seeing things in heaven, it, it moved back to the earth when John was told to go and take this open book from the angel that was standing with one foot in the, in the water and one foot on the land, okay? So we've, we've moved this vision back down to earth. And he was given a measuring rod, and uh, he was told by someone, it doesn't tell us who, to get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worshipped it. He, he has also... Uh, move from, from seeing a vision to become part of the vision when he was given this, this measuring stick to, 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 to measure. The temple, the altar, and the worshipers appear before him in his vision. The old temple in Jerusalem had already been destroyed, so we know that it's not talking about the old temple in Jerusalem, but, it is, but we see this vision of that. Now, when we think about measuring something, we think about measuring something in inches, feet, yards, miles, whatever, or if you're into the uh, metric system, millimeters, meters, and things like that. So, but is it possible that this measuring stick or measuring rod was not really given to actually do a, a measurement of how these things are, but what if it was some, something used to basically see if the people involved were meeting the standards that God had set for them. In other words, this, this rod is a, a, a measurement of, of God's standards. So just something to think about. Um, and, and he was told to, to measure three things. All right, in verse 2, he, he, when he was told not to measure the court outside the temple, maybe the idea here is that that he was only to measure those that were followers of God, that claimed to follow God. Get right up here. In, in verse 2 there, the New King James translates nations, Gentiles. Right. And they were not allowed to go inside the, when the temple was there, you know. That's right. They were just had to stay outside. That was my next line, but that's okay. I like it when you're listening. <laughs> Very good. They were, they were not allowed to. So in Old Testament times, Jewish priests, they were allowed inside the court to worship God, but Gentiles were, were not allowed outside 
uh, allowed to come in, but they were allowed to be outside. They were allowed to be outside. And there were a lot of Gentiles that believed in God and, and actually followed and traveled with the Jews because of their belief in God. Uh, so maybe the church was being compared here to the temple under the old law. I don't know. And uh, maybe the word, the holy city here is used to describe heaven or the new Jerusalem. But again, back to this measurement stick that he had. Uh, I, I feel like it was more of a, a standard versus a actual measurement. Anybody have any comments on that? Got one over here. It also makes sense what you were talking about with AD 70 and AD 90 that what are you measuring if the descent, if the temple was destroyed in AD 70 then again that puts merit to Revelation being 90 especially later on in the next chapter where it says I saw a new Jerusalem mm -hmm. coming down well yeah. after it's after AD 70 the old Jerusalem is destroyed That's uh, good. Jesus was the one that prophesied not one stone would be left on top of the other at the temple That's right very good and the last part of this verse, we'll stop at verse 2, uh, we'll finish up this verse, but the last part of this verse is interesting as well. It's referring to the nations outside the court, which we, we already have identified as the, as the Gentiles. And it says, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And, and again, we've already established that, uh, I think it was Julius Caesar, I believe that's who I said it was, that, that started the 365-day, the 12-month year calendar. I mean, he was the one that kind of recognize that as a way of tracking time. And then we see this 42 months, which is equal to three and a half years or 1260 days. So in verse two, we see the 42 months. But if you look in verse three, which we won't get to this morning, uh, he, he uses the term 1260 days. So moving on. Uh, and, and this is probably referring to a period of time when the church was going to be corrupted by worldly men. And so, if that's what it was referring to, okay, if that's what it's referring to, then, then 42 months seems like a very short time, right, for, for this to happen. So, what if, what if it's 42 days or this 1260, uh, excuse me, this 42 months or 1260 days in this vision actually meant 1260 years? And sometimes numbers in the Bible are used that way. I'm just throwing this out at, at you. And so if it was actually representing 1260 years, then what, what group came into power and control, uh, not, not, not talking about the Roman Empire, but there's another group that came into power and came into control of the church for about 1260 years the Catholic Church. It was very powerful. And I think if you want to do some intense study on the book of Revelation, you need to look at that time of history and see how powerful they were, uh, the church, that church was at that time. Uh, they put people to death. Uh, they, they did not want their members to have Bibles. And, and so for 1260 years, they were very powerful. And I even remember even in my lifetime, and those of you that are my age or older can remember movies from the 50s and the 60s, and when religion was talked about in a movie or expressed in a movie, it was always Catholicism, always. And, uh, and, and so even today you'll see a little bit, little of it, but not like you did in movies from the 50s or the 60s. They were very powerful, and they, they maintained their power for a long time. But during that 1260-year period, they were very powerful. Uh, uh, and this would have been the time from when, uh, the time beginning with the, the, the Bishop of Rome who became the first Pope. And when did this power, when was this power kind of taken away from them? Something happened in history that kind of took this power away from them. The Reformation movement, right? The Reformation movement. Martin Luther, he, he, he rebelled against the, the Catholic Church. And as a matter of fact, his life was in danger. So that could be what all this is talking about. You know, I always hesitate mentioning a, a, another religious faith because I, I never want to offend anyone, uh, especially for my class. I don't like to mention things like that. But in this case, I feel like it's important to mention this because 
it's, it's in history. It's in history books uh, uh, about the Catholic Church. So I have, I have several Catholic friends and, and uh, think a world of them. And, uh, and they will not argue with the fact that the Catholic Church practices things even today in their worship and in their doctrine that we don't find in the Bible. So even they will, will admit that, but they still defend their beliefs. So uh, I'm going to stop there. We, uh, we've run out of time. And um, uh, we'll pick up with verse 3 next week. And I'm always leading a prayer, but I'm going to ask Brother Joe if he'd come up and lead a prayer for us today. Sorry I didn't give you a heads up. <laughs> Let's pray together, please. Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for this beautiful Sunday morning and the privilege that we have to come to study your word together. We're thankful for Brother Allen for the great lessons that he teaches from your word. We're thankful that we can go through your word and learn more of what is taught May we indeed look to you for guidance and for strength and for encouragement as we go through life day by day. And we pray, Lord, that as we look to the sick as well, that we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Joe. Thank all of you for your comments. I uh, really had some good comments today. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Do I lift up my soul. Oh my God, oh my God, I trust in thee. I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that way. Yea, let none that way. On thee be ashamed. On thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that way. Yea, let none that way. On thee be ashamed. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. 
I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. I have decided. On that resurrection morning, when the trumpet God shall sound, we shall rise, Hallelujah, we, we shall rise. rise. All the saints shall come rejoicing, and no tears will e'er be found. We shall rise, Hallelujah, we, we shall rise. We shall rise, Hallelujah, we shall rise. Amen, we shall rise. 
rise on that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken. We shall rise, Hallelujah, we shall rise on that resurrection morning. Blessed thought it is to be. We shall rise, Hallelujah, we shall rise. I shall see my blessed Savior who so freely died for me. We shall rise, Hallelujah, we shall rise. We shall rise, Hallelujah, we shall rise. Amen, we shall rise. Rise on that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken. We shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. On that resurrection morning, we shall meet him in the air. We shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. And be carried up to glory to our homes of bright and fair. We shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. We shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. Amen, we shall rise. On that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken, we shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. We shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. Amen, we shall rise. On that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken, we shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. We shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. Amen, we shall rise. On that. Resurrection morning when the prison bars are broken. We shall rise. Hallelujah, we shall rise. We shall rise. We shall rise. A thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. You will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself and bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame and the cry. Is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside. Sigh out, Lord, my soul cries out from the end. Sigh out, Lord, my soul cries out, Lord. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death. Nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, the Son of God. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, the Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high Amid that wild and savage crew Nor heard we that imploring cry Forgive they know not what they do But we believe the deed was done That 
I've started to a land where there's everlasting joy Singing with the angel band, there nothing to annoy There will be no friends and loved ones with them ever stay I'm going home to heaven some sweet day Shouting, singing, praises ringing in that happy land Friends I know Makes me want to go there with him on that strand Time is drawing nearer, I'm not long to stay I'm going home to heaven some sweet day There'll be no wars to grieve us, there'll be everlasting peace Friends will never have to leave us, parting will have ceased Soon my troubles will be over, I will sail away I'm going home to heaven some sweet day. Shouting, singing, praises ringing in that happy land. Friends, I know they makes me want to go there with them on that strand. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we come before you, our Creator and our Redeemer, offering thanks for another beautiful Lord's Day that you've given us and for all the many blessings that we have to enjoy. We're thankful for life itself and for the privilege that we have to serve you, the only true and living God. We're thankful, Father, that we can be together here this morning to worship you and we're thankful for each one that's here and we pray that our worship today will glorify you in spirit and in truth. Father, we're so thankful for the great love that you have for us to allow your only son to give his life on the cross to pay our debt for sin. It's a love that's beyond our comprehension. Father, we're thankful that Christ was willing to go to that cross and we're so thankful, Father, that through his death, burial, and resurrection that we now have the hope to spend eternity with you in heaven. Father, we pray for our church family here. We pray for our elders and deacons, for Greg, for all of our teachers, and for each member. We pray, Father, that we can always be the church that you want us to be. Father, we pray for our sick, especially those that were mentioned here this morning. We pray that you'll watch over them, and if it be your will, we pray that you'll restore their health. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to be with Kevin and restore him to his normal walks of life. Father, we know that we're weak and make mistakes and fall short of your glory. Father, help us to be humble enough to admit our mistakes and strong enough to overcome them and wise enough to learn from them. Father, we ask you now to be with each of us in our everyday lives. We pray that we're going to live our lives in a way that will bring glory and honor to you. We love you. We thank you for loving us, and we pray that your will be done in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's start this morning at number 608. 608. 
he gave me a song. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of 608. Fifty six. Five hundred fifty six. There is a C. Verses one and three at five hundred fifty six. books or actually just on the slides this morning our song of encouragement will be come to jesus we'll sing all verses of that song after our lesson this morning and before our lesson this morning we'll sing actually something familiar god give us christian homes we'll sing all verses of 843 if you would please stand for this song 843 all verses
Scripture reading this morning will come from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It's Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that none of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day, the freedom we have to come here and to worship you. At this time, Father, we pray for forgiveness of our sins, that sin may not hinder our prayers. Father, we pray for this country that we might turn back to you, for we have certainly forsaken you and left your word. We pray for the Ukraine, the people there that are being destroyed, their lives lost, children even killed. We pray that in your great ability and wisdom that you'll put an end to this war. Father, we pray for each home that's represented here this morning that can be the home that is right in your eyes. We pray for this congregation. As a people, we can be what you would have us to be. Help us to study your word and give us the understanding that we need to live by it. Father, we realize we do fail. We pray that you will strengthen us and forgive us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to wish everybody the, the happy Father's Day. And uh, you saw that coat he's wearing, right? Well, now you know where I get my coat problem. And of course, you got to give Alan a little credit. He is wearing pink today. It's taken us a while to get him to be a real man to wear pink, but he's got it. Now, he's always uh, worn the pink with us because, you know, what kind of example, but our dad has been giving us for years. But I do want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day and, and hope that you're able to spend time together and just enjoy being together as family. This morning I want to talk to you about the, the faith-grace battle, which is odd that there's a battle over it, which because it really shouldn't be, but there actually is in the religious world an argument or debate over what saves, faith or grace. So I want to look this morning at, at some scriptures, and, and I think we can logically through the Bible answer this very well. It should not be a difficult subject, as most of the Bible really shouldn't be, but then man gets a hold of it and it becomes complicated. But in Ephesians 2, 8 9, that was read a moment ago, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This one verse gets used a lot to argue actually both ways. And the, fa the fact that, no, it's grace that saves you. No, faith saves you. And yet, if you notice in the scripture, it actually mentions both. But then we have to ask the question, well, how does that work? Because we have to ask, you know, what does the Bible teach about my salvation? Well, what does it mean? Well, salvation means that we are being saved from sin and the punishment or consequences of sin, which, of course, is hell. Is it an all-God thing? In other words, is he the only active participant in my salvation? Either God saves me on his own or he doesn't. And that goes all the way back into, sorry, but boy, my eyes are killing me this morning. That goes even back into the predestination concept that God decides even before you're born whether you're saved. But that's a whole nother topic. And has it got nothing to do with me whatsoever? In other words, I have zero part or role, not obedience has nothing to do with it, cooperation has nothing to do with it, it is only God's grace that saves. And there are many that do argue that very fact, that you have zero part in your own salvation. So what is the issue that we're looking at? Well, salvation is of God, obviously. Jonah 2, 9, salvation is of the Lord. Without God, and his love, and his grace, salvation wouldn't be possible at all. I mean, let's just face the facts. Heaven is a place of perfection. 
where no sin or sinner can dwell. Which that in and of itself makes, well, that's impossible for humans to be there. Being human means we're not perfect. Are we saved by grace? Well, Ephesians 2, 8 says, by grace you have been saved. Telling the people in Ephesus, you've been saved by the grace of God. Uh, other things to look at would be, uh, is salvation a gift? Well, it says in Ephesians 2, 8, it is a gift of God. And be honest, it's a gift that we do not deserve. But it is given to us anyway. Can I earn my salvation? Again, Ephesians 2, 8 says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And if you watch TV evangelists very often, you hear a lot of boasting about what they have accomplished and how good of a person they have become. And, and they, some even teach that you can reach perfection as a human being. But I want to know the truth and not just people's opinion. Am I required to do anything to be saved? Does grace exclude all works on my part? And how does God save us by grace? Those are the questions I want to look at this morning and tonight. There's no way I could cover all this in one lesson. Neither of y'all still be here. Y'all have left for lunch. I was still preaching if I tried. I want to also ask, what is grace? I think that's where we need to start. And I looked at multiple definitions. Of course, quite often in regular dictionaries, it talks about whether you're graceful or not. I remember many years ago when Jeannie and I were still dating, we were camping somewhere, I think it was Cedars of Lebanon. They had the old, I don't know if you remember, it looked like a fishnet hammock. That while it's on the tree, it just looks like a wad, and you've got to separate it and sit down in it just right. And my mother went over there and she says, that looks so comfortable. And now, you know my mom, she's always been full of grace. And she went over there and she spread that and she tried to sit so ladylike and all of a sudden her feet went straight up in the air and she's laying on the ground. Great son that I was, I did go to help her up while I was dying laughing. That was not the grace we're talking about because she missed it completely. The grace we're talking about is a spiritual, godly grace. How is grace relate to us as Christians? It is the free unmerited favor of God. And I think that is a key definition. It is an unmerited, undeserved favor of God. It is manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings from Him. That is grace. Given favor to us from God that we do not, have not, and will ever deserve. Now, understanding that, we then ask the question, but is there anything required of me? I'm going to tell you, that'd be a really handy concept. And it is for many religions today. The concept that it's all grace. If I show up and sit on a pew, pew heaven. No matter what I do, no matter how I act, how I live my life. Because God loves me, His grace is going to save me. But is that really what the Bible tells us? Because Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Wait a minute. That just said I had to do something. That's an action required. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them will be likened unto a wise man. Wait a minute. There's an action again. I have to do something. Mark 10, 17. Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life. If it only is grace alone, why were these people not told, do nothing? Don't do anything. God's grace will save you. But that wasn't the answers they were given. Continuing, Acts 2, 38 and 37, they ask, after hearing the, the sermon on Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? There was a question. And it goes on in Acts 9 and 6, Lord, what do you want me to do? And in Acts 16, 30, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Once again, why weren't these people just told don't do anything? Why didn't Peter stand up that day and say, 
Now that you've asked the question, you don't have to do anything. You're now saved because you believe. But in every instance, every answer was something for them to do. So now we have to ask the question, does grace exclude all works? Now we read in Ephesians 2, 8 a minute ago, not of works, lest men should boast. In other words, you can't earn heaven on your own. That's not possible. You can't be good enough to earn heaven. Nobody has ever been perfect except one. And that, of course, was Jesus Christ. So let's look at some scriptures and analyze some of this for ourselves. Looking at Matthew 6, 11, we are given the example of we need to pray for our daily bread. Now, there has been instances in the Bible that we know, matter of fact, look at the children of Israel in the wilderness, where God literally sent them bread. He miraculously sent them bread every morning to feed them. But we're told in 2 Thessalonians 3.10 that we must work to provide. Continuing on, Acts 27, 24 tells us there, says all those on the ship would be saved with him. But in verse 31, there were regulations or rules to follow. The only way you can be saved on this ship with me is if you stay on this ship. If you leave the ship, you're going to die. There was something they had to do to get the salvation. Joshua 6, 2. God told Joshua that Jericho would be given to them. But we're also told in 3 through 5 and verse 20 that there was something they had to do. They had to walk around the walls. Had to walk around. And if they did what they were told... It would be given to them. You see, with every point of salvation, whether it be from war or whether it be from food or whatever, whatever it is that God's saying he will provide, there's also you have to do something. Grace, well, I forgot this one, Acts 15, 11, if you look there, is talking about Peter told the elders at Jerusalem that Gentiles would be saved in the same manner as Jews. But they also, in verse 35, had to obey God. Grace and works are not mutually exclusive, as so many like to take Ephesians 2, 8 to do. So let's look at what I'm talking about. Not of works that we're told in Ephesians 2, 9. Not the works of the devil. That's kind of clear. In other words, you can't obey Satan and expect God's grace to save you. It's not going to happen. Because we're told even the devils believe and tremble, but we're also told that the devils have a place prepared for them. And it's not heaven. Works of darkness, back to the, the sin. Anything we're doing out there that is ungodly, unrighteous, we can't continue doing those works and expect to be saved. Works of the flesh, our desires, And let's face it, we do that a lot, don't we? We work hard for our own personal desires. And it may be just as simple as a child doing chores so they can buy that toy they've waited for, or an adult doing our chores, which is going to work, saving up to get that bigger toy that we're waiting for. But we can get caught up in that very easily. Or the works of the law of Moses. And that's the big one, if you look in Galatians. Under the old law, they they basically had a checklist. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. If you do these things, then you can be saved. But under the new law, that's not how it works anymore. There's no checkoff list. There's no Ten Commandments, which they actually had multiples that were piled onto that, over 600 actually. 
that you had to follow and could check off. Remember the rich young ruler that said, you know, Lord, what must I do? And he says, you know, honor thy father and mother. And he says, I've done that since my youth up. One more thing you need to do. And it wasn't on the checkoff list. He gave him something that wasn't on the list. He didn't think was part of his job description. The young man went away sorrowful because he says, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. In other words, sacrifice your things for me. What we are justified, what works God does expect are the works of God. He expects us to do what he has asked us to do. Have you as parents ever given your children incentives? You know, if you do this, then I'll give you this. Or maybe it's, it's you do give them an allowance. My kids multiple times asked me for allowance as they were growing up, and I said, you get one. You're allowed to live in my home. You're allowed to stay in that room I gave you. You're allowed to wear the clothes I, I bought you, and you're allowed to eat all the food that you keep eating. See, that's an allowance. Some of you kids that get money say, thank you, Daddy, because it's Father's Day. But God has also given us jobs to do. Chores, obedience, those works, which we don't have time this morning to go into all of those, but everything from what he's asked us to do to we wash, have sin washed away to the way that we live our lives. Love your neighbor as yourself. That requires action, doesn't it? He tells us in James, you know, if you tell someone, oh, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them anything to help them, what have you accomplished? And he tells us faith without works is dead. But we just said you can't be saved by works. Those are obedient works of God. There are jobs as Christians. Can those works alone save us? Absolutely not. We talked about that it's a gift of God through His grace. Salvation is. But it comes with a stipulation. You have to do this if you wish to receive the grace of God. Another thing I think we struggle with is we think grace is something you're going to get on judgment day. That is not biblical either. He said in Ephesians 2, it has been by grace that you were saved. People in Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, had already received grace from God. There are some that, that believe that, well, on judgment day, now God's grace is going to save it. You can't get His grace until judgment day. No, God's grace is offered daily. Why do you think He asks us to repent of our sins and confess them? And He will forgive us our sins. He offers His grace constantly, but He also expects our obedience constantly. Faith is a work. Here's the flaw in a modern society. We want to say, well, faith means you believe in God. What did we say earlier in James? The devils believe and tremble. They believe, and that's just wonderful. But they're lost. Why? Because they don't obey. When we're talking about works, it's not something you're going to earn. It's obedience. Grace does not exclude faith. It's not a simple, you believe in God, God's grace is going to save you. Keep living the same way you always are. Keep doing what you're... That's not what the Bible tells us. Therefore, grace does not exclude all works, not works of obedience. The confusion is when he was talking to the people of Ephesus, he was talking about the works of the law. The Jews were obsessed with it. As long as I do this, 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 and this. Judaizers would come and they would argue over baptism. They'd argue over where the Christ had, had actually had been uh, raised from the dead. They'd argue about all these things because the Christianity took away that list of works that they could do to be saved. And he's telling them, those aren't going to save you. It's by God's grace through your faith that you're saved. But we have to properly define God's grace and faith biblically, to understand what these things mean. Salvation is by grace 
through our faith. What's that mean, Greg? In other words, as I show my faith to God, He continues to pour His grace on me. The blood of Jesus Christ will continually wash away my sins so that I can be perfect, even though as a human I can't be perfect. His grace started really at creation when He planned for His Son to come and die on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, that was grace. When he came up out of that grave, he was fulfilling grace. Why? So that when Peter and the, and the others preached and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They showed them how to receive the grace of God. Told them what? Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That was the answer. Not do nothing. Grace just saved you. They obviously believed or they wouldn't have asked the question. And if we're saved by just belief alone through God's grace, Peter should have said, nothing, you're good, going to heaven. But he didn't. He gave them something to do. And I've heard people argue that, well, baptism can't be a part of saving because that's a work. Well, brothers and sisters, it technically isn't singing praises to God, a work. I'm doing something. Praying to God, isn't that a work? I'm doing something. Giving to the poor, isn't that a work? Because I'm doing something. So if we're going to argue that works have nothing to do with salvation, then I'm going to say you worked this morning because you got up and came to church. But all of those are commands of Jesus Christ so that we may receive the beautiful, unmerited favor of God. Faith is a working faith, not a verbal one, not one of I feel belief in my heart and I love Jesus, but I'm going to keep doing it my way. It's a constant working faith by the way we live our lives. Romans 5, 1, we have access by faith into His grace. See? It's not automatically just because I'm a human, God says, voila, here's my grace. We have access to His grace by what? Through our faith. That's so important to understand. Our faith must be active every day of our life, not just on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. God expects us to be His children. Today's Father's Day. You know, I'd love to stand up here and tell you both my boys were perfect. All of you would know that I need to come forward because I just lied. But do I love them with all my heart? Absolutely. Am I proud of them as much as any father could possibly be? And I think about God, our Father. Am I perfect before Him? Absolutely not. Have I made mistakes I'm ashamed of? Absolutely. And sometimes even wonder why God has done so much for me and for the world in general because of how weak we are as human beings. But when I realize He's my Father, it makes sense. A Father loves no matter what. A Father continues to love even when their children make the, the biggest of mistakes. It never changes the love of a father. And even sometimes when children turn their back on their parents and their family and walk away, it breaks the father's heart, but it never breaks their love. And that's the way I see our father. As I've gotten older, I've realized it's, I like doing things that can make my father proud. Then I'm his son. That's what we should be striving to do for God. What can I do to show my father, my faith, how much I love him, to make him proud that I am a child of his, despite my weaknesses, despite my failures? What can I do to show God my faith so that I may be blessed 
with His grace. James 2.24 tells us that our salvation obviously is not by faith only because it takes God's mercy, His grace, His forgiveness, His gift of salvation. But it's only through faith. Because it tells us also in James 2.20 that faith without works is dead. Faith without obedience is dead. Faith without a godly life is dead. And if that faith is dead, what did it say we needed to be able to get to grace of God? Through our faith. Dead faith cannot get us the grace of God. And brothers and sisters, if we had time this morning, I could teach a whole other sermon on blessings, which is through the grace of God. Our families, our homes, our jobs, this congregation... I've had someone recently really touch my heart when they, they said that coming here they found a family. That's a compliment, brothers and sisters, that should be our goal with anyone who comes here. With anyone who obeys the gospel and becomes a part of God's family and chooses to stay here, that they feel like we are family to them. Because we are. We're God's family. This morning, if you're not yet a Christian, God's grace is there. Just like the prodigal son when he he started coming to his father and his father saw him from a long way off and he ran to him and he wrapped his arms around him. God is waiting patiently, watching daily for those who know him and know what they need to do to come home to him. Whether it be you've not obeyed the gospel yet and you need to come to your father or whether you've wandered away and you need to come back home. Either way, the arms of God are open to you this morning. If you're ready to obey the gospel and begin receiving the grace that God has promised you, then come forward and be baptized, as Peter said, for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you are a Christian, if you've wandered away, if you're struggling... You know, sometimes we don't run away from God, but sometimes we just stop moving. We just stop. And we need the strength and the courage to continue on. This morning, if you need the prayers of the church, or we can serve or help you in any way, will you come as we stand and sing?
song before the Lord's Supper this morning will be How Deep the Father's Love. How Deep the Father's Love. We'll sing all verses of this song. <clears throat> all verses. This morning we'll be uh, taking a portion of our reading this morning from Hebrews chapter 7 verses 23 through 28. Hebrews 7, 23 through 28 for those who like to follow along what I want to read. You know uh, the book Hebrews, I don't claim to be no scholar of this book by no means whatsoever, but it is a fantastic book to read and study if you have not had the opportunity to just kind of read through it and, and pick up on some good things. When we come across this, I, I read this portion of it and I, it really kind of brought to, to light and to mind and just a remembrance of how great and how wonderful of a hope of life of eternal life we have through Jesus Christ you know just 
the brief, just a real quick brief history. It seems like to me this is, of course, where the Israelites or, or the, the writer, I'm sorry, of the, of the book of Hebrews is trying to tell the Israelites, you know, there's a better thing coming. Uh, back in the old law, you know, we, they had to offer sacrifices for sin daily. Even those who, the high priest, they still had to offer sacrifices. But over in Hebrews chapter 7, uh, picking up at verse 23, the former priest on one hand existed in greater numbers because they were pre uh, prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save us forever, those who draw near to God through him. My, like I said, my, the version I'm reading from says, near to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercessions for them. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices for First for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of an oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. And then over in Hebrews 13, 8, is one of the great, great things that's so, so rewarding to me. I always think about is there it says, Christ is is the same yesterday, today, and forever always will be. Brothers and sisters, as a Christian, to me that is extremely comforting knowing all the trials and tribulations and, and adversity that we deal with on a daily basis in our lives, that we have Christ who once and for all went and paid that debt that we don't have to pay. You know, he took care of that for us. All he asked for us to do is to obey him. In each and every first day of the week, we come together to, to partake of this emblem that represents that freedom that, that Christ gives us. We have the, the bread, which, which represents his body, which was shed upon the cross. Uh, and then we have the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood, which, which is life, which is what Christ has given us as a hope of eternal salvation, is eternal life with him, through him, to be with him and his father forever and eternity. That is, as long as we obey his commandments. So as we take this time this morning to, to come together and to partake of this, this, these emblems, please just stop and think about that great gift, that great wonderful sacrifice that our Lord and Savior has done for us that we have that hope of salvation through him. Let's pray. Our most gracious, caring, loving, Heavenly Father above, we're so thankful, dear Lord, for this beautiful Lord's Day you've given us once again. We're so thankful, dear Lord, that we have this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ without the harm and fear of persecution, dear Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that this freedom will never be taken away from us and that we will never take this freedom from granted as well. Dear Lord, as we take this time to partake of this bread which represents your Son, who was so willingly, who came to this earth and lived as a man, who took upon the sins of this world and defeated death once and for all, dear Lord, and who is by your right hand at this time, dear Lord. I pray that you help us as Christians to reflect on that daily, not only today, but each and every day of our lives, dear Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. bow with me again please our most gracious heavenly father above we come to you again in prayer dear lord this morning ever so thankful for the gift of life that you've given us through the blood that was shed upon the cross of calvary through your son dear lord we're so thankful that that your son was so willingly to to come to this earth and to to teach examples dear lord and, and to be all about others and not about himself we're so thankful, dear Lord, for that hope and gift of life that you've given us through him. Heavenly Father, I pray this time once again as we take this time.
to reflect back upon that wonderful gift that you've given us through him that we will do so, dear Lord, in a way that will be well-pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Set apart from the Lord's Supper, we always take this time and opportunity to, uh, to give back just a small portion, a very small portion of what we are blessed with daily as, as human beings and as Christians. And of course, visitors, please don't feel obligated at this time to, to give. We just ask that you take the time maybe to fill out a visitor card there in front of you and pass it to one of the elders at, as you leave this afternoon so they can have a record of your attendance. It would be greatly appreciated. But as we take this time to give back, Think about those around us who don't really have that much at all. And think about how blessed that you really are as an as individual to be able to work, to provide a living for your family. And think about all the good works that come from the gifts that you give uh, as we come together. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, dear Lord, for the opportunity in life that you've given us to be able to provide a living for our families, dear Lord, to be able to have the funds that, that is needed to be able to get by from time to time. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us as Christians to always reflect back and realize and understand that all good things come from you and you only. Dear Lord, I pray that the monies that are collected here this morning will continue to do good work throughout this community and, and worldwide as well, dear Lord. I pray that you'll be with those who are responsible for distributing the funds, dear Lord, to the correct locations, that you'll bless them with the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding that will make the best benefit of the things that are collected each and every day. Dear Lord, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just please continue to forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, again, thank all of you for being here this morning, especially to our visitors. If you would like to stick around for a minute, we'd love to get to talk to you and know you. Um, and if you uh, would, if you want to come back any opportunity that you may have we'd love to have you if you would please stand for our closing song this morning that'll be 881 881 mansion over the hilltop we'll sing the first verse of 881 <clears throat> mm, i'm satisfied with just the cottage below a little silver and a little Dear Lord, we come to you today just thanking you so much for all your blessings that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the, the fathers out there today as we re remember them. And uh, most of all, remember you and uh, the sacrifice that you have given us, your son, that we can one day be with you. I ask that you watch over the people that were mentioned uh, this morning, that, Lord, you know what they're going through. And we ask that you watch over them and take care of them. Uh, be with us as we go our separate ways later. And, just uh, let us be a shining light into the world, uh, and then whenever we come back together, bring us all here safely. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>